All right, plugging it in my screen. And we should be live. Yes, hello everyone. It's nice that there are so many people here. Uh, I will try not to disappoint you. And my name is Michael Sajdak. I'm from Securag and from Securitium. And today I'll be speaking about really old vulnerabilities, which should be patched already, but they're not. And they are quite critical and maybe interesting. OK, about me, uh, I'm a pen tester and trainer. I'm concerned mostly about IoT security. This is my research, but I won't cover this today. And I work in security. We do pen testing and training, something like 250 pen tests a year and 100 trainings a year. OK, so let's start. And the first demo will be this stuff. So this is Logitech uh, R400 that I used in every single also IT security conference. And this is the most popular presentation clicker. And actually, this is clicker. This is dongle. This is clicker. This is backdoor. And actually, I can inject wirelessly. I'll try to do this in a moment. I can inject wirelessly any keystroke, not only page down, page up, any keystroke. For example, I can start calculator or download rootkit or anything, actually, on the target computer. So now I'm plugging this into my Windows. All right. And maybe I'll switch screen to my Windows, so the target. All right, here's my Windows with some garbage. And now I have this little dongle. I will talk about this a bit later, this crazy radio. And now I'm starting this color Linux. And is my pointer turned on? Yes. And we'll see if it works. So let's try, let's start scanning. Scanning, scanning, scanning. Still scanning. All right, and now let's try this keystroke injection. We'll see if it works. It should start calculator. So it works. Actually, you can input any single key. So next speakers, be warned. <laughs> OK. Let's move to my main laptop. And actually, how it works. All right, so common myths here are that this communication dongle and this clicker must be somehow encrypted. Of course, it's not true. And then, if it's not encrypted, we can only inject page down, page up, maybe escape, only a limited set of characters. It's also not true. We can inject, actually, every single key. And uh, what do we need? We need, for example, this stuff. This is normally used to control drones. There is a Swedish company which sells this stuff. It has power amplifier, external antenna, and it has a range of one kilometer. I'm not sure if I can inject any keystroke from one kilometer, but uh, I tried it at home uh, from behind the wall, and it worked. Uh, then we need uh, a custom firmware to this stuff, because this is used to control drones. We want to control someone with this. So little research from this Bastille company. It enables Prometheus mode, for example, on this stuff. And the last thing, a little script by company Sys, by the way, they have uh, tomorrow, as far as I remember, a presentation about their new research. So I invite you to, to them. And this Python script is quite simple. More or less, it just gets Windows run CMD, for example, here, and, or just calc. And uh, radio transmit, and that's it. Really, really simple. Any fix for this? Uh, this model, I think, is not patched. So if you buy a new one, it will be vulnerable. There's also a new research from April this year 
So Logitech are 800 is also vulnerable, 500 is also vulnerable to limited stroke injection and many different uh, vendors too. So it's not so, not so nice. For us, from security perspective, it's, it's quite nice. Okay, this is the first thing. Let's talk about, oh, maybe I will stop here a bit, about strange HTTP request. Do you think that this request is valid or invalid? Okay, who thinks it's valid? Hand up. Okay, not so many people who think it's invalid. Two, three. Okay, how about the others? <laughs> I don't know, okay, let's try. So I will try to start burp suite here. And I will try to go to h2securac.pl. All right, and what do we have here? I will try to remove all this garbage. All right, and now let's oh, maybe this too. And let's try. So of course it's valid, normal HTTP request. We have different files here, like admin, like innocent, like test, and so on and so on. And I, if I call here innocent, HTML, of course it's valid. If I put here test, it's of course valid, but let's try this stuff. So innocent, and now this get slash, it can be test or just slash. Uh, without this stuff, as far as I remember, let's, let's try. Uh, now we must turn off this. And we must put here this. Uh, test HTML, of course. So our final request, HTTP request is this. So blank line and this get without any protocol version here. And actually, we have two responses concatenated in, into, into one response. This is a bit strange. How it actually works? So let's go back to, to the presentation and it uses two different features. The first feature is something which is called HTTP pipelining. By the way, it's turned off in most of modern browsers but it's turned on in almost every modern HTTP server. And it allows me to send different HTTP uh, requests in one TCP connection without waiting for responses. So many, many different uh, requests without responses. This is one thing. And this stuff is HTTP version 09 protocol. And surprisingly, many, many, many HTTP servers still support this old version. So we have two things here, HTTP pipelining and then this HTTP 0 0.9. And it is quite nice to bypass web application firewalls, filters, stuff like this, because we normally do this request, our web application firewall or filter says it's, it's in a sense HTML, I can go with this request, go with this communication, and actually when it reaches HTTP server, it has two requests, this innocent and this admin, which is not checked by WAF or filter. Pretty nice trick. Okay, another interesting stuff for bypassing filter, uh, it's something which was defined in nine, 1996, not so new. And let's say we, allow, we are allowed to connect to this host, this xxxx.mil, and we are not allowed to connect to this internal website. And actually, if we issue requests like this, HTTP server will process the URLs as, as the following. This has priority number one, this has priority number two. So actually, we'll do HTTP request to this. And if we have check against this, if we are reaching this host, which is, uh, which is okay, then we are screwed. So we can bypass the filter. Okay, now another interesting stuff. It's called IBM 037 encoding. Uh, from the description, it looks pretty old, I guess. And, and let's see how it works. 
Once again, burp. Let's go to Securac. This time, let's go to burp. All right, and I will do something like this, repeater. All this garbage is unnecessary. All right, and I will have here a parameter like test value. Okay, now I'll try to change a request to post and, oh, maybe it was a bit too fast, so test value. This is pretty normal HTTP post request. Uh, okay, maybe this is, this is not good. All right. Okay, now there is one, ah, not, not after post, but here, before the protocol. Uh, right, and this is pretty normal request, and we can do a trick here. So, car set. Uh, something like this, as far as I remember. And you have garbage here. In params, you see normal test, normal value. And if our, once again, web application firewall or filter checks against this, and this filter doesn't understand this IBM 037 encoding, we can easily bypass any filter. We can encode XMLs in this stuff, and so on, so on. It's only an example. There is IBM 500, as so far remember. Yeah, another encoding. Different, different, different encodings here. Ideal for bypassing web application firewalls and different filters. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. Another interesting request. Maybe let's try this H2 Securac PL. And we have a little script which displays a me user agent, ua.php. So a little riddle for you. Uh, let's go back here. Let's remove this stuff. And I will provide this header. So let's see how it works. Uh, UA, of course. User agent tests, and now a little riddle. I will put here another user agent uh, with the value Securac. And what do you think will be the, the response? So the value of this user agent server site will be what? Securac or test? Who is for Securac? Hand up. Okay, who is for test? Okay, some of you. And who is for something else? Okay. More or less the same responses to each of my questions. So actually, this is the value. So not test, not Securac. And this is so-called folded, folded, folded header, HTTP folded header. So you can continue value after a little space. Another line, another space, and so on, so on. And sometimes HTTP servers or different filters don't know this stuff, and they can be crushed, they can be exploited, and stuff like this. For example, we had something in, in the last year in uh, light HTTPD. We have use of their free vulnerability uh, connected with parsing those folded headers. All right, something different. LD preload. I guess that most of you know uh, this stuff. So actually, it allows me to load any code, load my code, let's say, to any binary owned by me, let's say. And it works more or less like this. I should switch to, to a proper virtual machine. Uh, I will try to put this in, uh, in white background. All right. It was free as far as I remember, free. Okay, so we have, for example, this basic, very basic 
program in C, know this underscore init function. It's very important, and it just prints hello con confi or confidence. Let's try to do this like this. Now let's compile this. Uh, maybe not this, but and here basic. And let's try to uh, let's try to do something like this. LD preload basic this and start any binary like ID for example. Uh, okay, a little fix here should be this. And as you can see, just before the normal code starts, our code is executed. Right? We can inject any code before, I don't know, ls, once again, our code, and then ls. This is pretty standard. It's not a security vulnerability, unless, unless, for example, we had privilege escalation in FreeBSD. It was published as zero day some time ago, and actually the procedure was the same. So our code, uh, then we set LD preload to our code, then we run a suite binary on by root, and suite binary should ignore this LD preload, because without this we, has, we have code execution as root, but somehow it didn't, so we had root. Pretty, pretty simple. We had also uh, similar stuff in Linux, uh, almost or something like 20 years ago, and if you set twice the same uh, variable, LD preload, and then the same LD preload. The second was used by suite binary. So this LD preload is not so, uh, it's not so safe. And uh, one year and a half ago, we have another interesting stuff concerning this LD preload. So exploit against go, go ahead HTTP server. It is, it is really popular IoT HTTP server. I can try to navigate to, to Zoomai. All right, and search for go ahead HTTP servers. And, and you can see, as you can see, the simple response, the simple, simple query gives me something about 9 million uh, IP addresses, public IP addresses with this device. It's a, bit, uh, it's a bit of cheating because in 2019 we had only two millions. So it's quite okay. So let's see uh, what, is going on, what is going on about this exploit. All right. So basically we can do something like this. So we locate this vulnerable IoT then we go to CGI slash bin, and then we can target the default binary on those go ahead installation. Or we can uh, target any actually binary written in C, so it must load uh, external libraries. And where we put our code? More or less here. And I will try to show you real working exploit against this. So it's really, really simple, platform independent. And uh, first we'll need our code, and our shell will be really simple. So the same as before, this init function, and now we are starting netcat uh, on port 2222. Uh, I already compiled it and moved it from virtual machine to my MacBook, and I will try to I'll, I'll try to show it to you. Uh, first, I'll need to start uh, HTTP server. All right. Uh, this directory, I guess, just starting HTTP server. All right, what's my IP address? Uh, it's free at the end. 
So now let's try to navigate here. Okay. So now the CGI. Or CGI test. All right. So this is this is the default script which is installed on those HTTP servers when CGI is enabled. Exploit. So let's move to web suite. Let's move this to repeater. Let's start this diff let's this fancy LD preload. And how to um, send our code? We'll send this here in HTTP body, which in C CGI can be mapped here. So proc self fd0 standard input of course we must change this to post and now we're compiled so binary so i will paste from file i will take this shell probably probably it's it's this and before i start this i will check if uh, if the port 2222 is open or not. So, 2222, of course it's not opened. So now let's cross our fingers. LD preload, here's another input, and here's another input with this nice code. It, it's doing something, but here, as you can see, we can connect to the server and have privileges with this web server. So it's pretty easy. If you want to easily hack uh, an IoT device, you can check if it uses this uh, go-ahead HTTP server. It is really, really popular. And then if it uses CGI bin, if so, you can go with this trick. All right. Another crazy thing, which was introduced in 2009, and it's, it's in default configuration of PHP till now, and was presented uh, on Black Hat last year. And actually in PHP there is something which is called FAR. FAR is both a protocol and a file format. And it can be used quite easily to achieve remote code execution in many tricky situations. I will try to uh, live demo this for you. And all right. And for example, vulnerable code will look like this. So in PHP, only file exists. Of course, file read and so on also is okay, but only file exists against this protocol, empty far. So inside can be no PHP actually, no PHP packed, gives us remote code execution. Why? because of this. So in metadata of this far archive, we can put serialized PHP data. So we serialized malicious object or objects, and then if PHP is checking if this file exists, it also parses this metadata, so it does silent deserialization. So we put this serialized, uh, let's say, remote code execution, and then we must find a place in an application which we control first part of, uh, of this. The important stuff is that this extension can be anything. It can be JPEG, it can be .png, it can be .dupa, everything actually. So we can easily bypass any filters. Only JPEGs are allowed? Okay, let's go with JPEG. I'll try to show, show this to you live. Okay, and we'll need one more tool so this uh, PHP GGC creates us this serialized data or it creates just this for. It can be an extension here, actually. And if we want to run id command, we just run this stuff like this. So let's move to our scenario. And our scenario will look like this. First step here, uh, we'll need to upload our file, our for. It can be used uh, or any function which, or any functionality which allows us to upload, I know, avatar or our agreement or our CV or something can be used here. So this file is uploaded here without any tricks. 
The structure of, of this file is a bit tricky, more about this later, first step. And then in the second step, we must, we must locate a place which can read or check if this file exists. So, for example, XML external entities is a perfect place for this. And normally, XML external entities allows are for reading files, uh, listing directories, or maybe server-side request forgery. Uh, they don't allow for remote code execution. The system here doesn't allow any remote code execution. But if we locate a place in, in an application, like in API or just normal place in the application which accepts XML, we can add here doc type. Uh, we can point this to our file and use this entity. So XML parser will try to read this. PHP will, will deserialize stuff here and we have remote code execution. So let's move to my virtual machine. All right. Now we have IP address four. Four. So the first step is to create uh, this far file. Actually, this is normally done not on the target server, but on my virtual machine, right? But I must then upload this file to the target machine and point the path in this XXC. But let's try this. I've downloaded just normal, you know, example JPEG file. I can try to uh, embed here something malicious in this test JPEG, and this time port 4444. And uh, not here, uh, here. Right, we can see how it looks like. So HTML cache, and let's try this brutal cut here. And it looks not so nice, but somewhere, somewhere in the beginning we have, we have this stuff. This is PHP serialized data, which deserialize start system function and then this net cut. And by the way, this file looks pretty normal. So let's, let's see. So it was for cache and then test JPEG. Pretty normal file. Now let's start our attack. So we have our application, which is on the same IP address. So here. This simple application just accepts an XML. Any place which accepts XML is okay. What should I do here? I should put here doc type. So let's move to, to here. This pretty, pretty standard XXE. It's nothing fancy. Now we must point here the path to, to my binary. So it was in var www HTML cache, as far as I remember. All uh, right, and we must use this entity as HP somewhere. So for example, let's try this here. Okay, before clicking check stocks or sending this to the server, I will try this port 4444. So let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, right, fixes in a moment. Uh, let's try this port 4444. Shouldn't. Listen, right, and now let's go to fixing. Missing E, all right. And actually it has here one more error, I guess, one more error. Let's go check stock, errors, but still connection refused. Can you spot any error here? Yeah, one more slash, because this is protocol and this is path. So it must be absolute path. Once again, hopefully no more errors. <laughs> and now as you can see, I have remote code execution. So pretty nice stuff. I guess most of you know this uh, XXC, XML external entity. Now there's a way to more or less easy re execute code in PHP environments. 
Okay, let's move on. Uh, NTLL. I will check my time. I have a bit more minutes. NTLL. Actually, this is Windows NT, and uh, it was used something in like something 1996, so it's quite old. And Microsoft introduced then a new way to store users' passwords. It was called NT-Hash or NTLM hash. And previously, they used LM hash, which is extremely easy to crack. And this new version was a bit tougher. And the nice thing is that most of people think that no, NTLM is not used anymore. We have Kerberos, we have NTLM version 2, stuff like this. No, these are protocols, and this NTLM hash is hash. So actually, if you try to dump hashes from your Windows 10 or Windows 2016 server, uh, there will be NTLM hashes. And for example, you can use very well-known tool Mimikatz to do this. This is an example session on Windows 2016 session uh, server. And as you can see, hash NTLM here, hash NTLM here. And how fast it can be cracked? Actually, quite fast, and Hashcat team a couple of months ago uh, announced that on one uh, GPU, it was quite new GPU, so this uh, RTX 2080 Ti, they achieved 100 something more than 100 giga hashes per second, this speed. So actually, every single password, small letters, capital letters, uh, special characters, digit, up to eight characters can be uh, cracked in less than 20, 24 hours. So it's quite interesting. Really, really nice stuff. Okay, and probably our last topic, zip horrors. And actually this zip format was introduced in 1989. And till now, most or many, many zip packers use two different methods for encrypting files or encrypting archives. The first one, most of the time, it should be default one. It's pkzip crypto or zip crypto. And another one is using AAS, so modern encryption algorithm. And actually, this can be cracked easily, quite easily or quite fast. Uh, it was uh, a new paper a couple of months ago with first GPU implementation of those zips, uh, I mean cracking password of those zips. And there are two types of attack. The first type is full brute force. Full brute force, so you know, you know nothing, actually. And the speed is something like 18 giga hashes per second. So uh, every password less than eight character can be cracked. Uh, in actually less than four days on a single GPU. And there is another attack. It was well known, or it, is, it has been known since, 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 since 1994 or something, but now it's implemented on a GPU. So if you know at least 13 cons consecutive bytes of plain text, I mean plain text of this encrypted zip, you can start this non plain text attack. And actually, the speed of cracking is like this. So 22 zeta hashes per second. So this is the number. This checks per second. And actually, it cracks every password up to 15 characters in less than 15 hours uh, on four very strong GPUs. So the lesson for you is please don't use zip crypto on just use as cryptography within zip or just compress or encrypt files using 7-zip. All right, another interesting stuff is this. This is valid since, since the zip format was born. So actually you can pack uh, in zip this strange file name and you can also pack uh, a symlink within zip. You can pack also zip bomb Let's try with this last example. Zip bomb. Zip bomb is pretty, pretty normal. It's pretty small file. 
which can be unzipped into this petabytes. So it's quite good. So if you are uploading this file and our application uh, decompresses this zip blindly, we can kill this application. Nice stuff. But maybe this is more interesting. Do we have more 10 minutes or not? Five minutes. I will try to do this in five minutes then. <laughs> uh, I will need to start a new virtual machine. So it can be tricky. I will kill maybe this one. I will kill. All right, killed. All right, maybe I will kill also this one. All right. And I'll try to show you a real working vulnerability with this strange path with zip. All right, ignore, and let's start this. Network card. Uh, all right, Wi-Fi, we can start. So my virtual machine is starting, and now, well, yeah, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, hopefully it's starting. Let's talk about Fury. So, if you have an application which accepts a zip file and you want to have remote code execution, so you want to upload the shell, you can name your shell or your, you can name your file like this. So we go up, 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 then your directory and shell. And almost all is extracting zips, stars blindly without checking for stuff like this or this. If you want to read your password from the server, you can create a zip with symlink to etc password or your local computer, pack symlink, upload this, and when it's decompressed, you can read this password, but now it points to etc password on the server. Pretty crazy. And actually, I don't know, maybe two months ago, there was a little bug with this Cisco Prime infrastructure. And actually, they used a similar trick. So they uploaded a tar, tar archive, and they named the file inside here. So their uh, Java JSP web shell was unpacked to the place where they were able to run, run any commands. And another interesting stuff, a problem with OS X, so MacBooks. It was patched like two weeks ago, maybe. So actually, the exploit here uh, involved using symlink. So if you pack zip with a symlink and send this file to someone, they unpack this, but they unpack symlink. And the symlink was maliciously, maliciously placed to a directory on a file system which was uh, removed from standard checks on OS X. And if someone was clicking this, he was actually doing remote code execution. So you can see not only web applications, but stuff like this are vulnerable. So let's go to our virtual machine. All right, address five this time. And this will be our last demo. All right, Nuxeo. And this Nuxeo is quite popular document management in Java. And you need any username, I will use here admin, but any username is okay here, to have remote code execution by uploading a zip file. So let's log in. Let's see our zip file. Our zip file is, is here. I'll show you this here. OK, so it looks more or less like this. So you can see double dot slash, double dot slash, double dot slash, our shell. This is replaced, and here we have this shell JSP packed. It's a simple form with one input box. We input here a command, and it's executed and uh, returned in the standard response. So let's try to upload this file. We have workspaces here where we can upload files. Any user is OK. We only need to upload a file. So we choose file here. Comfy and our 
vol. All right. Create. Right, now we must unpack this somehow because it's not automatically unpacked. So we just navigate to this config file. Right, and right click, right click and, and preview. Oh, it disappears, oh, gosh, all right. Maybe something is wrong with my browser, no worries. So maybe I'll start this nice browser Safari. Okay, login, and now we must only unpack our file, so workspaces, test and our comfy, right click and then preview. Just let's see what's inside. So it forces our Nuxel to unpack this. A little error because the name was a bit strange. And now let's navigate here. It was maybe here, JSP, right. And you can see we can issue any command. So standard way to upload a JSP shell. It's very, very common. Almost every time you encounter this zip stuff and unpacking zip stuff, you can exploit it in this way. All right, they head back this year. Meta exploit the same. <laughs> so by importing malicious project, they had remote code execution in Meta exploit is really, really uh, popular. Okay, that's it. 